Hi everyone, my name is Adebayo Okelawa and I'm the creative director, owner, CEO, whatever name you want to call me, <laughs> of Orange Culture Nigeria, an androgynous menswear brand which is based in Lagos, produces in Lagos, supply chain in Lagos. Um, and we basically have been running this brand for about 10 years now. Um, so yeah, that's me, Adiba. My name is Ellie Owenikoko. Sounds like a joke, but I'm serious. <laughs> I am the junior designer at Orange Culture. <laughs> um, my job title includes me helping and doing research and forecasting trends to figure out what could be commercial for the next season we're creating and then drawing designs alongside that presenting creative director in line with what the creative director wants for a brief and then also taking care of production so managing production of samples and production of orders i'm in charge of all that hi my name is Anoyoa and i am the Head of Accessories Designer at Orange Culture and also the personal assistant to Bayo, the creative director. Um, on accessories design, I designed some of the pieces you'll be seeing in this collection, which I'm excited for. Um, some pieces ranging from earrings to bags to corsets and some other things, which was um, centered around conversation, which was um, the theme for this collection, Faces in the Cloud. And was um, created to um, surround conversations around the masculinity and how beats are seen. Most of the accessories are done with beats and that's because we wanted to create conversations around how beats are worn and how it, um, how it correlates with masculinity in this space. So I'm excited and you should be as well. So I've literally been running this brand since I was about 20 years old. Um, I started this brand out of a passion and love for fashion. I've loved fashion since I was a little kid. Um, even when I was 10, I would draw on all my school books. Um, my teachers would complain that my school books were not meant for sketches, but I would keep on drawing anyways. And I love the way fashion always made people also feel, because when people dress up, there's a certain sense of confidence and joy and beauty that just emanates from them when they wear clothes. So that always excited me. And I remember my first experience interacting with the fashion industry was when I was 10 which is a story that's so odd because I remember I was sketching. I had so many sketches when I was younger. And my auntie, um, who lived in London, she'd come to Lagos all the time. And I had like this big TV box that we had like kept stored for a TV that we were using. And I would like draw sketches and I'd cut them out. We used like, used to use like this Argos magazine silhouettes to like draw sketches. And I would cut them out with scissors and put them in the box. And so she'd come to Lagos and she'd see all these sketches. And so she was like, oh, you know, I love these sketches. What are you doing with them? And I was like, oh, I'm just drawing. I just love drawing. And so she took them to London and then she made all of these pieces. Like she made like, so it was like nice at 10 years old, seeing like my drawings being made by someone. And then she put them in a shop in Kent. So it was just like, oh, wow. Like this is something that I could actually do. So obviously in Nigeria, you know, Fashion wasn't really a viable industry to go into. I mean, there weren't really fashion schools when I was growing up. Um, fashion wasn't a part of our syllabus. It wasn't available in most schools to study. So I love fashion, but there wasn't really any direct route towards it. I couldn't afford to go to CSM or Parsons or any of those schools. So I literally was wondering how I was going to get into fashion. So I started interning. I started interning from when I was like 15, 16. I would work with like Elan, worked with um, Arise, worked with uh, magazines, worked with designers, Kikamanu, Zebra. I just started working in as many places as possible to sort of get a grasp on the industry and to understand how fashion worked. So from then on, I started building my knowledge on fashion because I obviously didn't have any background in fashion. My background was in finance um, and international management. So I didn't have a fashion background per se. So when I obviously figured out how to work with the industry and I understood how the fashion design business works, I then launched my brand in 2010, in 2010 from a love for fashion and with a story that was inspired by, you know, my experiences growing up in Nigeria as a boy who looks like me, for example, or dresses like me or didn't really fit into you know the stereotypes that you know people had sort of predisposed or whatever for men to fit into um for me when i launched the brand i really wanted the brand to really connect with that ideology of celebrating this 
space of individuality and uniqueness and differentiation and also a space to question these ideas of like how men are supposed to be and that specificity of you know that masculine ideology was really what put me as an outcast when I grew up and so for me starting my brand I really wanted to create a brand that was all accepting and representing this diverse expression of men you know saying that oh you can be any type of man you can be you can express yourself with color you can sound different you can look different and no one should make you feel threatened for it I mean Lagos is really one of the most interesting places to work because um, you know there's so many opportunities and I always people always ask me how is it creating such a brand in Lagos um, I know there's so many opportunities to create this type of brand in Lagos because if I were somewhere else my story might not matter as much um, if I were somewhere else I'd probably have less of an impact because the industry is so developed in so many other parts of the world but here as a brand we were able to really have an impact whether it's social socioeconomically whether it's in terms of social conversations in terms of actual infrastructure in terms of supply chain local development we've been able to do so much more as a brand here in Lagos and there's so much beauty with Lagos to be inspired by culturally I mean, I grew up seeing so much color. It's crazy because to me, seeing people tell me, oh, men shouldn't wear pink or wear orange or whatever. I grew up with our traditional wear being colorful. Like our badas were like soaked in Ankara and reds and you know, in emerald greens and all these different colors. And to then have conversations where people are telling me, oh, but men shouldn't wear this. Because I'm like, but that's our traditional wear. Or where men would wear wrappers or skirts in traditional wear. And then now it's like, oh my God, why is a man wearing a wrap, you know? So all of those things were things that really shocked me when I tried to go into fashion, but were things that led me to the idea that we really needed to talk more about how vulnerable men needed to be and how emotionally expressive men wanted to be and how colorful and diverse men needed to be and so for me being here in Lagos I felt was um, kismet because I felt like I needed to be here and the brand needed to be here to create those conversations and lead the conversation for other people to then also follow so yeah Lagos has been a crazy experience from the good the bad the ugly it's been beautiful for us because you know, we've been so inspired and been so um, lucky to do so much within the within the country. We've been lucky to show in New York, show in London, Paris. Um, we're lucky to be nominated for the LVMH Prize, Walmart Prize. Um, and so many amazing things I can't even begin to start. Every magazine that you can imagine, we've been spoken about. And so we've been very honored to be a part of that conversation. But it's also made us think a lot more as to what it means to be a Nigerian and an African designer within the global sphere of fashion. And you know, that has led us to a lot of difficult conversations because the truth is, you know, as designers, sometimes, especially when you're a black designer and an African designer having to deal in a global space, it can be quite limiting because a lot of the time there's so many different stereotypes that are already imprinted in the minds of, you know, the press, in the minds of, you know, people, this sort of communicating with the brand. And, you know, people, for example, have asked us, oh, why doesn't your brand make Ankara, for example? Why doesn't your brand stick to specific known African or supposed to be known African fabrics. Well, for example, Ankara is not a Nigerian fabric. It's a fabric that's inspired by Africa, but it's actually made in the Netherlands. So it's not even our fabric, it's another man's fabric. Um, but people have created this notion as to what an African designer is supposed to create and what an African designer is supposed to look like. And so it's been a privilege being able to shape the minds of people and re-educate and say, this is actually our story. You know, we can interpret it however we want. We're not going to use some colonialistic um, measure or colonialistic um, view or gaze on how we're supposed to express ourselves as designers. And the collection that we're showing, um, which, you know, um, is that SS21, is inspired by um, this guy who was like, you know, in the 70s called Aria Skata. And he was this person who would like enter you know, the place and really just scatter the place with his dressing, with, you know, the way he performed and everything. So he was almost like this outcast that people used to sort of like, you know, misunderstand and make fun of and whatnot. And so we basically wanted to create a collection that was inspired by people who have come before us and have been able to sort of lead a space for us to be who we are today, a space for, um, self-representation in your own way, a space for liberation, basically just honoring people who have been here in Nigeria fighting the fight for us 
whether it's in terms of their style, in terms of the way they speak up for others, in terms of the way they speak up for the minorities and they speak up for, you know, for gender equality, people who are fighting the good fight and who therefore have led to us in this generation being able to do so as well. Um, this is so interesting for me because um, I also, like Bayon does not have a fashion background. I started working with Orange Culture in 2019. Yes, 2019. And before then, all I knew was accounting. I had just finished, I just graduated uni and I started accounting. I'm a chartered accountant. And um, in 2018, I think, towards the end of 2018, I got a scholarship to do um, a course of persons. I got a scholarship to do something in fashion and persons and then I knew I wanted to be with Orange Culture, it was either Orange Culture or no other brand because they told stories that were androgynous and stories that question what the norm is. Coming from a typical Nigerian home, it was a lot of traditional things which we really didn't need in this generation and um, some conversation that we needed to have which is why which orange culture has been doing for about some time and so you have to be orange culture or nothing being buyer's assistant is um as exciting as seeing all the pieces in the collection because um i had to source for fabrics um engage in conversation with suppliers and out on how to get fabrics down and because it was done during the lockdown stroke when the lockdown was freshly eased it was so difficult and we also had to be very sensitive and um we had to be very sensitive because of the safe team measures we had to follow because it was really really difficult getting fabrics in time and conversation there's more conversations about getting fabrics but that is not for now this is about the collection and um, we, we, we had to ship one fabric when I think about it now. Yeah, we had to ship one fabric and do it in about two days. And to be honest, you guys just have to be really excited because we really created this for you and you would love it. So, creating faces in the cloud was two opposing emotions involved. The beginning was very relaxed because it was just, you know, getting ideas, getting inspiration, coming up with designs, and I was new, so I was very excited to like be getting to work fast. And then there was like just a pause in the middle and just high anxiety because the lockdown happened. And it was like, when are we going to start creating this thing? And then the lockdown was lifted and then it became very intense. We had to create the entire collection in crunch time. And yes, I think, this is the emotional issues associated with how I was feeling at the time. But then it worked out and I'm so happy and I hope you guys like it. Well, you have to like it. There's no other choice. Always were inspired when we create silhouettes by traditional shapes. We then translate to non-traditional shapes because we really think about sort of convert, converting our traditional shapes to things that people can wear every day. Uh, androgynous shapes, androgynous fabrics. We love to work with fluid, soft, um, fabrics that people would not normally see, which we've been doing for 10 years, that I wouldn't normally see on men, for example, or on women, and then also like sort of like just merge that because we like to play that line when it comes to fashion between supposed men, male and female, because we feel like with fashion, it shouldn't really be gendered, even though it is just because of the business point of view, they always ask for it, it to be somewhat gendered, but we feel like fashion should be able to cross lines and just express itself how it pleases. So we try to play with fabrics that allow for both. And yeah, I can't wait for you guys to see the collection. It's fun, it's expressive, it's colorful, it's, it's emotional. And yeah, I hope you guys love it. It's called Faces in the Clouds, so enjoy.